it's 2021 and we're still waiting to see if we're all gonna die and you know it seems to be looking up there's there's vaccines some some of the time some of the time so it's anyone's guess at this point and besides all the death that is both the fault of negligence and malice on the part of the ruling class and our supposed civil servants. Uh, on top of that, uh, the film industry may also be slowly being killed. Death, 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 lunch. Death, 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 afternoon tea. Death, 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 quick shower. As we know, movie theaters have been closed for over a year. And instead of injecting any value or support into the arts, like everything else that could be considered a business, it's all kind of been left free-falling without much of a safety net or else been forced to continue business unsafely and risk spreading, you know, the literal plague that we all have to live with. And on top of that, the Paramount Decrees, a decades-old court ruling, has been overturned. But now there is nothing stopping film corporations from monopolizing and segregating access to all of their products. Not that some of them didn't already have a pretty big head start on that already. Nearly everything has moved to streaming now in the advent of the pandemic. And obviously that is much safer in the pandemic. But since these corporations have just seen as much success by leaving theaters, they don't seem to think they have any obligation or incentive to ever go back. I mean, it doesn't change the fact that we are living with a new reality. Honestly, things won't be the same, not just uh, for how business shifts, but in terms of public health and safety. Anyway, all of this, <coughs> I'm rambling a bit, although it will, I hope, tie into what I'm trying to communicate. Because this unsettling reality is something I don't think any of us have had time to really grapple with and really consider. I think the reason for that is just that we haven't really been thinking about the future very much at all. But the Walt Disney Corporation is, if not our god, then gradually positioning itself as our one true overlord. And while it is certainly not the only entertainment conglomerate consolidating its power and desiccating, absorbing other smaller industries, it is certainly the biggest growing empire out there. Disney wants to homogenize and assimilate every IP it gets its hand on for maximum profit and the widest appeal. And that includes repackaging its own previously successful and culturally relevant films. We've obviously been <laughs> inundated with a deluge of live action remakes, although some of them sequels and prequels that no one asked for and yet are incredibly profitable. And I'm certainly not the first to point any of this out. Nor am I the first to point out that these films are shameless nostalgia mining, but also that they fail to make any improvement on the original and, in a lot of cases, manage to create new points of controversy and fundamentally misunderstand philosophical value of the stories they're remaking. And there's also a point to be made about the snobbery of venerating live action over animation. It certainly isn't something unique to Disney, but they certainly have a controlling interest, despite animation being a much more versatile medium of storytelling. And the impetus on any kind of artistic level is basically just concept art what ifs. Wouldn't it be cool if this cartoon was a real boy? The fundamental thing that we have to ask ourselves is why do these exist? Why do we need Beauty and the Beast in live action? Is there anything that could be improved about a story about a horned dog man and his staff of knickknacks with faces by making it more realistic? And maybe there is a rational answer of why they should be made. But the unfortunate, predictable, actual answer is, of course, money. Not art, not creativity, not even genuine audience demand, apparently. Uh, just nostalgia bucks, as it were, furthering the empire 
and not through innovation, but by recycling previous success, colonizing its own past. Just making copies of copies. A Mickey Mouse headed snake eating its own tail. And yet, even with all this in mind, in my opinion, there is an exception. The 2016 Pete's Dragon, directed by David Lowry. Because despite being released into the thick of all this late stage Disney, this is a film that is a rare miracle that is perhaps seen once a generation, if lucky. Because Disney is capable of making good art, but it doesn't happen often. And obviously in the broader sense of filmmaking, the concept of a remake need not be bad. There are remakes that are good. Some films benefit from a remake. Some remakes actually manage to be better than their original version. Some remakes tell the same story better. Others manage to salvage what worked about the original and build something new from it. And that is essentially Pete's Dragon of 2016. And I want to talk about why it works. To me, anyway. Why it means actually quite a lot to myself. I'll talk about where it came from and if it means anything in the grand scheme of the state of Disney and Hollywood. Okay, so the thing about <laughs> the thing about 1977's Pete's Dragon, I'm sure there are fans of this movie. I'm sure people have nostalgia for it. But this movie, having watched it in its entirety, now, as an adult, this movie is, in a word, exhausting to me. It's Dragon! It's not the worst thing ever. There are worse things. But it ain't a good movie. I don't think we should kid ourselves about that. The best I can possibly say is that it could be a passable movie. If you cut... The best I could say is that it is a passable movie, but only if you did some serious editing. I'd say cut about 30 to 40 minutes out of its over two hours. It is over two hours. A singing movie about a cartoon dragon, and it's over two hours. Sing! Higher and higher and glide above the clouds. Dance! And laugh. This movie is, two hour, is over two hours long. It somehow feels closer to three hours. Anyway, I will attempt, for those who have not seen it, because I am a first time viewer, I will attempt to briefly summarize Pete's Dragon 1977. I am not really gonna do a deep dive because this, I'm sorry to say to your inner child, to whoever out there is nostalgic for this movie, I am sorry to say this movie is not that deep. So we have Pete, and Pete is a scruffy young orphan who is rescued from white slavery? Slavery? Yes, slavery. Does they make a point of that? <laughs> we got a bill of sale right here that says he belongs to us. Okay. All right, sure. He's rescued from slavery by a big green cartoon dragon. The best pal a boy could ever have. I love you too. Who can turn invisible and who makes a lot of very weird noises. This dragon's name is El, 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 Elliot, 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 my dragon. So then the Appalachian hillbilly stereotypes. Yes, who have enslaved him are now hot on his trail and are trying to get him back. Uh, so Pete and Elliot take refuge in the maritime village of Passamaquoddy, which I looked up um, and apparently it is the name of an indigenous tribe. And also in this movie, there is repeated, very exhausting jokes about how no one can pronounce it properly. <laughs> can I accurately gauge where in the country this is supposed to be or what time period. I will assume by what I see that it is Maine or 
Rhode Island or somewhere like that, and I think in the early 1900s. So Elliot tries stealthily to enter the town, but makes a big mess. In a weird incident, some woman's whole entire night shift underwear gets ripped right off accidentally. Shenanigans. <laughs> Elliot and Pete run into the town drunk, Mickey Rooney, who promptly <laughs> has a conniption and starts to yell, Dragon! to anyone who will hear. Dragon! No one believes him, of course. And his daughter, Nora, shows up to take him home. She is casually harassed at the bar. There is an exhausting dance number. Nora and Mickey Rooney find Pete and bring him home for the night at the lighthouse that they operate. Uh, we learn Nora had a fiance, Paul, who is presumed lost at sea. And meanwhile, Dr. Terminus, snake oil salesman who dresses like a magician, fucking sails, and I mean sails, into town on his land speeder cart with his intern Hoagie and their anatomical skeleton child. Beware of the evil Dr. Terminus and his helper Hoagie. He is established as a con artist in another tiresome musical number. Something, something, jokes about drag queens and the Moulin Rouge. Okay. I'm so confused. Mickey Rooney gets drunk and tells Terminus at the bar that he saw a dragon. Hoagie gets drunk and he and Mickey Rooney sneak into the seaside cave where Elliot is sleeping and everyone shits their pants. And Elliot drinks whiskey and breathes fire. <laughs> and explodes, kind of. Nora sends Pete to school and Elliot follows. The teacher does some socially acceptable child abuse on Pete because he's misbehaving, uh, or she thinks he is. Elliot loses his shit and breaks the schoolhouse. <laughs> Terminus sees this and now believes dragons are in fact real and plans to capture Elliot so he can turn him into brain force pills or something. At the lighthouse, another musical number while they clean the white... Clean the lighthouse. Sing! Higher and higher and glide above the cloud. For, okay, the hillbillies come back and they say they got a bill of sale for Pete. Pete is a slave. Terminus recruits the hillbillies to help him catch Elliot in exchange for Pete. They spring a trap to catch Elliot with Pete as bait. Elliot gets out. Terminus is literally hoisted by his own petard, which I will admit is kind of funny. Elliot burns the bill of sale, and so now Pete is free. Mickey, Rudy, and Nora adopt Pete. And meanwhile, off screen, Elliot used the dragon force or something to summon Nora's presumed dead fiance, Paul, who has been shipwrecked with amnesia. <laughs> they are all reunited. He doesn't have amnesia anymore. This movie is batshit and I, I am tired. At the end, Elliot must go because the winds have changed. I mean, uh, sorry, I mean, there are other kids who need uh, his help. As Elliot's kind of like a fairy godmother, or perhaps a flying nanny. He and Pete say goodbye. The goddamn end. You're the most wonderful dragon in the whole world. You're never too old to feel young. I actually vaguely remember catching bits of this movie on TV. Ironically, it was like a TV at like a rental store when I was a kid, and I didn't really connect what movie it was until much later. Having watched it now as an adult, I don't know if I would have enjoyed it as a child. Even if I was the right age group, I'm not sure what children would. I mean, I think there's worse children's entertainment out there. Not only is it too long, but it feels like the running time is being noticeably padded. There are so many musical numbers which just aren't very memorable, and nearly every scene feels vastly disconnected. It gives them this movie this kind of fugish stream of consciousness quality, and I don't know if that's me, I don't know if that's subjective. That's why it just feels exhausting. Maybe it's a movie to put your kids down for a nap. It felt like if I was watching it late at night, it would put me to sleep. It is also a absolutely shameless retread of Mary Poppins in tone, in nearly all the gimmicks and set pieces. There's just like a thing where there's a guy with a cannon on top of a rooftop and there's like all this nautical stuff. At least it's more like appropriate to the setting 
as opposed to Mary Poppins, but they're just, just doing the Admiral. And, so, and like I said, so much more. It's the same time period, it's got a lot of the same story beats, it's got so many musical numbers, and it's got cartoon elements in this live action movie. It might be made the year Star Wars came out. This film really wants you to be thinking about the early 60s. It's not inherently a terrible idea for a movie, and I think a lot of the parts of it are fun. And some parts are so absurd that they border on midnight movie levels of camp. It's just unfortunate that the rest of the movie is so boring. <laughs> I will say that the animation of Elliot, which while obviously doesn't look great now, I think clearly was pretty revolutionary for its time. But on the other hand, I think Mary Poppins did it better. <laughs> and that was 10 years earlier. I will say the practical effects they use to kind of convey uh, Elliot's invisible, like all the destruction he wreaks the things they rigged up. All of that is very competent and I like it. It looks cool. I don't want to be mean to anyone in this movie. All the people acting in it are doing a good job. They're good performers. Doing good work for what this movie is. Just cumulatively, this movie just wears you down. My biggest philosophical gripe I have with this film is, is a big missed opportunity. See, Pete is an orphan and he is alone in the world and he falls victim to abuse at the hands of exploitative guardians. It's literally sold into slavery, but also it's kind of like these people are supposed to be his guardians, they're supposed to be his family. That feels like a pretty real and relevant topic to put in a children's film. And you know, I think if done right, it could be an admirable one. A more mature film, a more mature studio, might have explored this subject with the respect it deserves. But this is Disney. And Pete's Dragon 1977 wasn't made to tell an important story. It was made because the company had the rights to a story since the 1940s. And in the late 70s, they wanted to prove that they weren't irrelevant as a children's media corporation. It is interesting. I have heard there are people who aren't nostalgic for this. And this wasn't like a flop. But it's not a very good movie, guys. And I think there are much better pieces of children's media to consume. Now, all, all of that being said, on this channel, I'm not here to conclusively say thing bad or even thing good. I'm not an objective authority on anything, and arguably, there is no objective authority on art and entertainment on nearly anything. And I'm genuinely not here to shit on things. I'm not here to cancel people. I'm not really here to shit on this movie. I think it is flawed. I think it mostly means well. And if you love it and remember it from your childhood, think of it fondly, that's great. And all of this is to say this context going forward in this video will be necessary. Disney has made some classics in their time, but they've also made a lot of duds, and that's inevitable. Some failed experiments and some cynical cash-ins, and there's also not like complete consensus on every project. But the topic of this essay is remakes, Disney ones in particular, and the justification behind them. This movie, this movie occupies a niche of media very dear to me. Shall we just call it, um, stuff that emotionally wrecks my shit. But there will be spoilers. If you haven't already seen it, I would really recommend you go watch it. I hope I will try and zero in on the relevant details to what I think makes this story special, at least special to me. I'd watched it years earlier and undeniably found it very moving in a simple heartstring pulling kind of way. And I love a good cry. But watching it again, I was surprised at the little details I hadn't noticed before. A brief intro and necessary warning about the setup for this film. Okay, so like the original, Pete's Dragon 2016 is also about an orphan boy named Pete who has a big green dragon friend can also turn invisible, and the dragon's name is Elliot, and both concern Pete's search for a family and a stable home. Thus end the similarities. <laughs> this story appears to take place in the early 80s in a any town USA logging community called Millhaven, somewhere near the Rocky Mountains, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. We begin with a younger Pete on a car trip with his parents, the last time he will spend with them. And there's an accident, 
and his parents are gone. Pete is alone, lost in the woods. The only possession Pete can salvage from the crash is a children's book called Elliot Gets Lost. He had only just learned how to read the first lines, which are the first lines of the film. This is the story of a puppy. His name is Elliot. He is going on an adventure. Pete is surrounded by wolves, and here the titular green dragon appears to save him, to protect him, to stay by his side. Six years later, we meet up with the main characters of our story. There's a park ranger named Grace, her father, Meacham, her fiance Jack, his daughter Natalie, and Jack's brother Gavin. Each of them is going to discover a strange wild boy, the bravest boy they've ever met. Taking the place of Mickey Rooney is Meacham, played by Robert Redford, a stratospheric upgrade. <laughs> Instead of the town drunk, Meacham is the town crackpot because he is one of the only people who knows dragons exist, having encountered one decades earlier. The whole film is framed around Meacham's stories. At the beginning, he regales a group of kids about his meeting with a dragon. Though it's framed like he's telling a fairy tale, he insists it's the truth. When Grace presses him on the story, he stands by it because though he knows full well that it defies any kind of logic, the feeling he had was so authentic, it's impossible for him to doubt. In another scene, Natalie asks Pete if the Elliot he keeps talking about is an imaginary friend. Pete doesn't understand what this means and what an imaginary friend is, so they parse out that imaginary friend is someone who you make up to feel better. Pete asks if Natalie is imaginary, and she says she's real, and Pete says, So is Ellie. This is fascinating to me because it raises the point that Meacham echoes. Although Elliot is in fact physically real, on an emotional level, the film asks, is there any meaningful difference, any distinction between real and imaginary? Grace says, just because you say it's true doesn't mean it is. But her father counters, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it isn't true. And I could definitely see a religious person seeing this kind of as a roundabout metaphor for God or for their faith. And even as an a-religious person myself, that the, I believe this reading fits on a more human level of belief. Another name for emotional comfort, the kind of emotional comfort we all rely on, as well as this other theme of this childlike power of wonder, of imagination, and how it helps us interpret the universe and our own feelings. Elliot and the dragon Meacham encountered do physically exist, we learn by the end of the film, but even if they didn't, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the feeling that they represent, the roles that they serve. They would still be real even if they were imaginary. This is a Disney joint, so naturally a fantastical fairy tale aesthetic is expected. But I was struck for that for the first time since I can remember in this story, the concept of magical stories, of tall tales, and the imagination of children is a central theme. Though it's set in America, the movie was filmed in New Zealand, attempting to present a heightened, a more storybook version of the USA. The setting of the story also feels mature and strongly grounded in its rural working class community. It doesn't really push any political boundaries, or even a far cry from the days of Newsies and Natty Gann. But visually, director David Lowry brings his trademark vision of a grounded Americana, tinged with this kind of magical realism. This movie actually earns the descriptor of a modern fairy tale more than most films, in my opinion. At the end of the film, Meacham tells another yarn about the dragon and the little boy never being seen again. But perhaps, if you're looking in the right place, that you might find something magical. This tale we see is partly a lie, but it also hints at a truth, which Meacham can't say directly, else risking Elliot and Pete's safety. It's a story. It's a story full of magic, and also full of lies, but also full of truth as well. If I had to sum up what this story is about, I'd say it's about being brave. About being brave enough to find a place to feel safe in. The film is well constructed enough that a handful of disparate threads weave together to form a coherent, layered theme. The start of Pete's story 
I feel is a literal representation of not just isolation, but also the inability to grieve following a tragedy. For over six years, Pete has had no contact with the human world. He's lost all sense of his concept of aging, of the passage of time. And when he finally collides with society, he immediately contrives to escape on several occasions and offers to leave himself voluntarily to mitigate any conflict that they run into. Pete has become dependent on Elliot, dependent on the reality they've lived in for years. His resistance to society seems to represent more than just a fear of strangers. It seems to represent an avoidance of people reminding him of a painful reality that he hasn't come to terms with. And though we're only led to assume it, Elliot appears to be the same. He's alone, without any kin of his own, when we meet him at the beginning of the story, just like Pete. The both of them are just as distraught and worried when they are separated from each other. Elliot might be saving Pete physically from the bears and the wolves in the forest, but the two of them are saving each other from loneliness and the emotional torture that they're not really allowing themselves to feel through avoidance and through play, through this fun, carefree existence. Their bond is illustrated by this howling noise they make to each other. Kind of like Peter Pan's crowing at first, where it's like joyful, but later that howl becomes desperate and pained when they're separated from each other, devastated when they have to part ways. Oh! 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 It's part of their codependence on each other, but also their, their need for each other. But this dovetails into the other theme of stories and real and imaginary friends. In a way, Pete did conjure Elliot to feel better about his circumstances. He's a childlike escape, and he's a protector, and a brother, family, and a friend. And the journey of the film is the both of them realizing that it's time to move on, that they need to take the next steps. Over the course of the story, everything changes. Finally coming into contact with people, and people specifically who are offering compassion and support. That Pete isn't the same person as he was at the beginning. His frozen trauma is beginning to thaw. When Elliot suggests uh, they return to the forest to hide, he shows Pete that he can just become invisible to hide from the humans, even though their secret is out. And Pete says, But I can't disappear. And he means not merely that he can't turn invisible, or also that his existence is no longer a secret, but not just that he can't disappear, but he doesn't really want to anymore. That he knows he shouldn't. He's scared to leave the forest. He's scared to move on, to properly accept what he lost. And he's scared to leave Elliot, but he also wants to and needs to go. And Pete is also resistant, but Elliot knows he needs to a family. He knows he needs the support that he hasn't been getting, that he sadly can't get with Elliot. When I started to write this, I thought about Pete's trauma, and I thought about how profoundly unresolved it's been all this time. I started thinking, what does Pete think about losing his parents? What does a child who is very, very young, what do they think about their parents dying in front of them? How much does Pete understand? How much has he allowed himself to understand? And I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I know, or at least the movie tells us, whatever Pete is going to need going forward to deal with that, he can't find it out in the woods. So when Pete first meets Elliot and he lays a hand on his fur, the dragon suddenly changes color to a brighter shade of green, seeming to light up, and the frightened, devastated kid stops crying, and he starts to smile. Later, Jack's daughter Natalie experiences the same thing when she also touches the dragon, and there is this extended scene where Grace talks to her father, Meacham, and he describes a similar experience from the time that he encountered a dragon years earlier. I've never been so scared in my life. But when I raised my gun to shoot, suddenly there was this feeling, this 
It's like magic. There's no other word to express it. It was magic. So I put my gun down. We just sat there. We, we sat there across the creek from each other, just just looking. I just sat there looking, and then the dragon turned and disappeared into the woods. And I remember thinking, I am one lucky guy. And I knew what people were saying about me, and, and I must admit, there were times when I thought maybe they're right. But then, then I thought about the magic. It changes the way I see the world, the way I see trees, the way I see sunshine, the way even I see you. I wouldn't trade that for anything. But in contrast, then there's Gavin. He also comes across Elliot in the woods, but no such feeling of magic greets him. If I had to describe Gavin in a word, it would be insecure. He embodies this pretty on-the-nose kind of masculinity, which is fear and aggression based. He's not a man malicious man, but he is careless rather than empathetic. He is fearful and he responds to conflict with a kind of, I mean, literal hunter's kind of mentality, this very antiquated way of behaving. But underneath, we do get hints of his feelings of distrust and reproachfulness with his brother Jack, which seem to spring from feelings of inadequacy. It's refreshing, honestly, to see a portrayal of toxic masculinity, and in a children's film, no less, that isn't just as simplistic as the bully. But also, we see that Gavin is not fundamentally a bad person. He has reason to be scared of a creature that he doesn't understand, but he doesn't lead with kindness and understanding the way the other characters do. In the end, he also seems to change his tune when he sees Elliot is basically just a frightened creature trying to defend Pete and himself. He and Elliot have this similarity. Elliot is a more naturally trusting creature. Other characters are more naturally empathetic and understanding people. And at the end of the story, we see hints of a kinder Gavin, a man who has seemed to have softened, who seems to have seen the error of his behavior. And honestly, a case could be made that this metaphor of Elliot having this effect on people it seems like Gavin is more amenable to that now. This feeling of emotional safety. Elsewhere in the film, there's also, it's a subtle dynamic, but there is this dynamic uh, to power. It's incredibly slight, but it also feels more honest to me than most mainstream products, especially those produced by Disney. The police in the small town of Millhaven are portrayed as affable, but not strictly benevolent. Grace and her family are on friendly terms with the sheriff, but they also don't actually dare trust him with the secret of Elliot, or with Pete for that matter, after they begin to understand more of Pete's situation. And then when Gavin and the hunters capture Elliot, the police are quick to take Gavin's side in protecting his property. There's also a short scene that alludes to child services, where Grace sees a van and looks at it with this kind of knowing obligation to report Pete to the authorities, but also trepidation, not just because of this attachment uh, that she seems to have formed with this child, but also, in my opinion, this implicit understanding and this kind of understanding that we cannot kind of easily identify as knowing that the system is not amenable to actually emotionally and psychologically caring for children, especially orphaned and traumatized kids. But also I think more fundamentally, it ties back to this theme of finding safety. He doesn't feel safe when he's around men like Gavin, but he does with Elliot. Over the course of the film, he begins to feel safe with Grace and her family. Grace doesn't feel the authorities are a safe place for Pete or for Elliot. And conversely, Gavin doesn't feel safe and experience the kind of magical feeling in Elliot's presence the way Meacham did with the other dragon because he is not at that time when we meet him in the film a safe understanding person to be around. Then there is this recurring motif of North, the compass heading of North. There's Meacham's song which goes go north go north where the three rivers meet and on the one hand it lays out this fairy tale dimension, this kind of urban legend, and this mythology around the dragon. And then there's also Grace's compass, which was inherited to her by her father, which at the start of the story, Pete gets his hand on. And allegedly also, 
the home of where the dragons is meant to be is somewhere up north of where they live. So, Canada? And this theme of direction goes back to Pete and Elliot both being lost in the woods, no idea where to go, and of the heading they need to find, a safe place they need to find, home. And it's no coincidence that when Pete finds Grace for the first time in the film, first thing he does is take the compass from her. And later in the story, as he begins to trust her, and as he begins to feel more at home, she lets him hold on to it. And more and more through the story, he doesn't need the literal compass. It's more than that. A safe place is with people you care about, people who listen to you, what you need, who are patient with you when you're afraid and upset, where you don't have to disappear because people want you to stay. And all of this is to say of what I think the incredible value of this film is, of this version of Pete's Dragon. On the one hand, it didn't delve into anything as dark as I might have assumed, like abuse or neglect, as I thought the original could have tackled if it was better written. But I think it told a mature tale for kids that is just as valuable for all the reasons I stated. At least it certainly touched me in this way. And on closer examination, so much of it became so clear. His themes of loneliness, isolation, coming to terms with loss, the ways in which trauma can freeze us in place, but also on the positive side, the vitality and authenticity of imagination. That believing in magic isn't just this positive feeling for kids that this film wanted to impart, but also that it is just fundamentally important in people's emotional development. And finally, that everyone needs a place to feel safe and wanted. I think a very shallow reading of this film would just be, oh, kid, he's a, he's a lonely kid and he just needs a mom or he needs a dad and he needs a parent. Traditional gender roles, traditional nuclear family. I think more fundamentally it is saying people need understanding of our vulnerability and we need people to teach us how to be kind how to be kind to others and how to be kind to ourselves. Disney, to put it bluntly, is the biggest swinging dick in the media right now. An ever-growing capitalist monopoly. We all know this. We all know that Michael Eisner quote by now about making money first and art like fourth. And I think that quote is kind of saying it's like, you can do both. But you have to make money first. But I think what capitalists, or at least the rhetoric around capitalism, don't tell you is that it is rare to have it both ways. And this era of filmmaking, Disney in particular, is, is very solid proof of that. You can't make art incidentally. You have to do it intentionally. If you choose money first, the art will suffer. When an enterprise is motivated by profit, it becomes harder and harder for a project to have artistic value. Capitalism is about selling to as many people as possible to fill the bottomless ambition of profit. To do that, you have to make a product that is as palatable to everyone of as many walks of life as possible, at the very least key demographics that the corporation favors. And that is usually white, middle class, liberal slash moderate, conservative, and thus you make a product that doesn't say much of anything for itself, probably even reinforces regressive cultural values. And all of this is not just the opposite of art, but it is anathema to good art. I guess what I'm left thinking is, I really doubt we'll ever see anything as good as Pete's Dragon from Disney again. And I'm also kind of sad that I think a lot of people found it fairly forgettable or didn't go see it. All of that is subjective, of course, but it really feels like this has kind of been lost in the bunch. And I think part of that is just the nature of what the Disney remakes are. I really doubt we'll see anything as good as this again, unless the company <laughs> busts unless the bubble bursts. We are in the late stage of capitalism. It can't go on forever. They might kill the planet first, but I don't know which will, 
which will happen. This Pete's Dragon, I think, just was an incredibly rare example of the mouse returning to the well of past endeavors and actually managing to create something new and worthwhile. It's a remake that justified it, its existence. To some extent, that's why I'm okay with projects like Maleficent and Cruella, which I haven't seen. Malef or Cruella, I mean, because, you know. I don't have $40 to blow on your fucking Premiere Access. I'm not paying for shit. But I don't mind those projects because they are at least remixing Disney properties, which had diminished in popularity. But I also can't deny it's like this version of Peace Dragon would not have happened if it weren't part of this bill to green light projects for nostalgia bucks. Currently, there is a shit million remakes and sequels and other stuff in the works at Disney according to IMDb. One includes remake of Hunchback of Notre Dame. A case could be made that that movie wasn't perfect. It could be improved on. <laughs> Will they take the right lessons from it? And there's also a little mermaid redo coming up. And while it's cool that Ariel is gonna be played by a black woman, many people have pointed out a lot of the criticism about that movie is a bit unwarranted and it just feels like a remake of a story like this is just going to butcher the point with a lot of hollow wokeness and over explaining just like they did to Beauty and the Beast. On the one hand I gotta be thinking like, hey Disney, you could be making good movies, that would be missing the point. Sure, they could. Disney will keep eating up everything in its path. Other film studios, media companies, big and small, even though they are well past full, even though they don't need any more. And as a consequence, they don't really have an incentive to make much of anything new and fulfilling. Not that there isn't new and fulfilling projects being made, but they are kind of lost in the sea of all this recycled content. Disney is happy to just give us crumbs. They have the biggest franchises on earth under their disposal, except for <laughs> Harry Potter. For now. <laughs> and honestly, I don't think demanding that these corporations do better will ever amount to anything. Just as a side note, I, when I say Disney, I mean the corporate heads. I am not talking about the many talented artists and artisans and craftspeople working for the Disney Corporation who no doubt are doing their best and are playing the trade in a way that they don't find objectionable. Cool. That's not who I'm after. I guess what? That's where my conclusion is at. Do we need to eat the rich before they eat everything we care about? Before the planet is destroyed? Probably. Yeah. Anyway, I made this video because this version of Pete's Dragon really moved me. I love it a lot. But I realize that's because it was made by artists who gave a shit about what they were doing. They were allowed a dwindlingly rare opportunity. They were allowed an incredible amount of creative freedom on this project. But on the other hand, the project was dictated by it. it has to be, you know, based on this thing we already made. Director David Lowry said that this was an, ended up being an incredibly personal project to him. I think that's why, part of why I like this movie, not just because it was so lovingly made, but also because it was the best case scenario for one of these projects. So as of right now, David Lowry the director of Pete's Dragon, is apparently working on an adaptation of Peter Pan and Wendy for Disney. That's coming out in 2022. And I really hope it's good. Lowry is actually a filmmaker I, I like a lot, but I am happy that he is keeping most of his work fairly indie for the most part. I'm also I'm happy he appears, appears not, not to be to working, working with Casey fucking Affleck anymore. Anyway, in this video, I just wanted to highlight Pete's Dragon today not only because I feel it deserves more recognition to be remembered, distinguished from the rest, but also because it's the kind of film Disney could be making but probably won't again. Because corporations don't care about cinema. They have no obligation to make art. They have no obligation to make history, to make a statement, but to make money. I would never actively defend Mr. Walter Disney, anti-Semite and union buster that he was, but he at least talked like he gave a shit about the stories he was telling, about the art he was producing. I wanted to talk about Pete's Dragon because we might never see its like for a long, long time.
watching, everybody. Are people watching? If anybody is watching it and you uh, enjoy this, uh, I'm fairly new to this, but this is, by this I mean <laughs> running a YouTube channel is something I've wanted to do for a long time. I'm making it up as I go along. But I, if you enjoyed this video and you would be in, be, be amused uh, to uh, see to another, see. if you would like to see videos that are more, perhaps less INFP crafted and appeal a bit more to facts and logic, uh, as it were Please let me know I definitely you know appease the algorithm and all that like, like subscribe, subscribe ring, ring the bell, the bell. leave comments even if they're horrible horrible nasty mean comments Don't be a dick, but you know if you liked it leave a comment if you didn't like it Tell me why <laughs> I do you have a Patreon? I mean, I don't know why you want to give me money now, but if you do, you can. You can do that. And then I might have people to put in the end of my videos. I am treating this like a job for now, but it is not my job. Not until I get enough subscribers. But I would like to do this um, fairly regularly. Not weekly, but fairly regular. Fairly regular, yeah. Yes, indeed. I do have some video ideas lined up. I have at least one fairly big project which has been in the works for a while. And you know, I think once we get up and running, if this proves to be something I can do regularly and doesn't completely implode on me, then we might, I might uh, open the floor up to voting on topics and things like that. Um, but mostly this is just me talking, Me talking about, about whatever, whatever I want to talk about. I just have a lot of feelings. Thank you all. And if people in the future are watching this video um, and uh, in a time when I do have fans, thank you. 